My name is Brian Widener. I'm the Assistant Professor of Instrumental Music Education at Butler University. Uh, today's talk is about the concept of comprehensive musicianship through performance, which is one approach uh, for being able to teach the ensemble classroom. Now, a couple of caveats on the, in this. Uh, first of all, it's important to note that I am not here in any official capacity uh, within the CMP community. Um, CMP is a nationwide program that has uh, localized workshops that are organized by state-based communities. Um, I'm not a member of any of those uh, at the moment, uh, but rather I'm presenting this uh, in the spirit of recognizing CMP as a valuable way for us to approach our ensemble classrooms with an eye on student learning and on conceptual-based teaching. So a quick um, reference point of comprehensive musicianship. Um, comprehensive musicianship starts originally in the 1950s as a movement. If we take you back to 1959, uh, we'd see that music education at this point is dominated by um, a community service sort of mentality. Um, our large ensembles exist primarily to serve the community as musical organizations. Um, not to say there is no focus on education, but there is a relatively limited focus on the con concept of conception. Uh, Sorry, uh, on comprehensive music education um, outside of immediate performance settings. Um, there's very much a focus on developing a student's ability to be able to perform in meaningful ways in community-based organizations. So in 1959, uh, the, the um, Contemporary Music Project uh, is formed uh, and notably receives one of the largest grants to date for music education, a $1.6 million grant over 15 years from the Ford Foundation, um, which was intended to support the development of a new, um, new for 1959, a new form of music education that embraced not only performance, um, but other ways of music making, um, including a composer in residence program for public schools, um, institutes for music uh, focused on contemporary music education, and notably for us today, the Comprehensive Musicianship Project. Now this um, movement in 1965 um, is one of many reform movements happening in music education. This is the same time uh, as the Tanglewood uh, 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 Symposium is occurring, and the Comprehensive Musicianship Seminars at Northwestern in 1965 run very much akin to the sorts of conversations that are going on at Tanglewood, that the state of music and music education in the United States needs to change to better address the needs of students today and the needs of musicians today. Out of that 1965 movement, our 1965 meeting, we find that there are four large areas of study um, that the attendees at that first seminar believe are critically important to be able to have a comprehensive understanding of music education. You'll notice that performance skills are part of this. So this is not in place of performance, but rather in addition to performance. Um, these other areas include areas around composition, um, and in this case, they're talking formal composition. Um, skills for analysis and uh, extended oral skills. And then um, a broad category, broadly termed as history and literature, but really looking at contextual music education. Um, can we have music education that recognizes that music is not formed in a vacuum, but rather um, is created in a setting of culture, in a setting of society, and in a setting of time. So following um, that first meeting in 1965, there are several supplemental meetings, um, subsequent meetings that continue through 1973. And um, there's also the creation of the Institutes of Music and Contemporary Education, which serve as laboratories for this sort of work. Um, by 1973, as the original $1.6 million grant uh, runs out, we find that comprehensive musicianship has taken many different faces around the country. Some of these are directly tied to the uh, comprehensive musicianship seminars, uh, such as the Manhattanville Music Curriculum Project and the Hawaii Music Curriculum Project. Others um, serve as some sort of an offshoot of that. Um, the work of Labuda and Garofalo form uh, into their own um, approaches to the ensemble that focus on elements of comprehensive musicianship. Um, and other programs exist that become really multinational efforts um, to look at music in comprehensive ways. And this brings us to comprehensive musicianship in 1977. Uh, comprehensive musicianship through performance, I should say. Um, in 1977, the Wisconsin Music Education Association has its first 
meeting to discuss um, a new direction for music education. And their primary focus is looking at a balance of music performance along with comprehensive music musicianship. Many of the efforts that had come out of uh, the comprehensive musicianship movement seemed to exclude the ensemble. And there was a strong belief that the ensemble needed to be at the center of whatever was formed. Um, the reason we're talking about comprehensive musicianship through performance from Wisconsin is this is, of all of the movements that happened in comprehensive musicianship, the one that has continued um, to have a presence and continued to spread, albeit very slowly, um, for the first 10 to 15 years of its life, it was pretty much re re um, restrained just to Wisconsin. Um, and what we've seen over uh, the past almost half decade now is that it has continued to spread, or sorry, half century now, uh, that it has continued to spread from Wisconsin into neighboring states and now becoming a national phenomenon. When we look at CMP, um, as it is frequently termed, and as I will refer to it for the rest of this uh, presentation, uh, we find that there were some standard underlying beliefs um, that these educators felt were critically important for any sort of new music education philosophy and framework. Um, first of all, that the role of music education was to prepare independent musicians. And this is not just independent performers, but rather people who, who can engage in music in independent ways as performers, creators, responders, collaborators. Second, there was an underlying belief um, that through careful planning, students are able to accomplish meaningful learning. Um, this was a direct uh, focus against the reactionary sorts of practices that oftentimes come up in the rehearsal setting. Uh, the idea that the music classroom is something that is about responding to what the students bring in as opposed to planning for where they might be next. Um, a third tenant uh, that the CMP committee felt was important was that um, quality music education is multidimensional. There are many different forms of engagement within it. This is inclusive of performance, but also gets into areas of creativity, areas of analysis, and areas of criticism. That it's critical in order to be a comprehensive musician to engage in music in a comprehensive range of ways. Fourth, there was a belief um, a strong belief that the quality of literature is tantamount in its importance, as it provides the foundation of what can potentially be taught. Now, there's a caveat in this, um, in that um, everything that is within a piece of music will not be taught in any one lesson, any one unit, any one concert cycle, but rather that we cannot teach what is not present already in the music. And for that reason, there's a large conversation, and we'll be looking at that in a couple of minutes, around the idea of what, is, what makes music quality um, for a school ensemble and how we work within that. Last but not least, um, there is a running belief within the CMP group that assessment is constant and ongoing. That it happens before we begin assessment in the form of pre-assessments. It happens during assessment as a way to gauge the quality of learning. And it happens after learning um, as a way to gauge the learning that has been done and to adjust things as students move forward. Importantly, this is about multiple forms of assessment as well. So just as uh, the instruction is uh, multidimensional, the assessment should also be multidimensional. I want to share with you just a quick quote that comes from that first meeting of our, the Comprehensive Musicianship um, Committee because I think it really encapsulates the focus of um, what CMP is really about. Comprehensive teaching, where students take initiative into their own learning, produces creative results that exceed expectation. Um, the goal here is about moving students into being their own musicians who are able to have ownership in their learning and a broad conceptual knowledge that then they're able to apply to whatever sorts of music making they do in the future. The, so the final CMP model is oftentimes um, represented by this five-point model. And importantly, um, any of these points um, can be entry points uh, to planning and entry points to learning. Likewise, these five points are all in um, balance with one another. There is no one element that is more important. Um, and this serves really in two ways within CMP classrooms. One, this provides a framework for planning the classroom. Um, the teacher with intentionality um, looks at each of these five elements of selection, assessment, str instructional strategies, instructional outcomes, and musical analysis to be able to determine how and what they want to teach. Um, but additionally, this is also a philosophy in place. Um, and this philosophy really points to a core belief of what is most important in learning. 
Um, and this is balanced out in a couple of different ways. One, there's a focus on both what happens immediately in today's lesson, but likewise, a long game that looks at where students are going to be at the end of a month, the end of a year, the end of a musical experience at our school, at the end of their lifetime as musicians. Um, and it's about finding different ways for students to engage. And importantly, when we look at CMP, there's a balance between two critical groups. One of those groups um, is our students that are in the classroom. And it's a consideration of who they are and what sorts of musical needs they have. The other one is for the music itself. And it's recognizing that there is content um, in place and that while we're responsive to our students, we also need to be responsive to making sure that their musical experiences that they have are meaningful and are thoroughly exploring the music that they have before them. So in the next few minutes, we're gonna explore each of those five components. And I'd like to start uh, with that of outcomes because for me as a teacher, this is oftentimes where I start my lessons. And as Laura Sinberg, one of um, the uh, major academics right now in CMP um, stated, outcomes are very simply, what do you want the students to learn? Um, Outcomes within CMP build very much on the same sorts of models that Wiggins and McTighe uh, present in their understanding by design or backward design models. Um, in that we start with outcomes, we move to the specific learning instructional uh, activities, and then we move to the assessment activities. But that everything we do within the classroom is about starting at that outcome level. And these can be outcomes for an individual lesson. These can be outcomes for a uh, entire unit plan, entire concert cycle or they can be outcomes for a program. As students come into your high school or middle school, what do we want them to be able to do as they walk out? Um, there's also an emphasis within CMP on spiral curriculum models, uh, taken from the work of Jerome Bruner. Uh, the idea that we come back iteratively to the same musical ideas, each time taking it one step higher, um, so that students are building on the knowledge they already have, and that we're recognizing what students bring to the classroom. A third important component within this is that um, these outcomes are focused on the concept of transfer. That what we learn in one piece of music is then able to be applied to a different piece of music in the future. Um, Bloom's taxonomy is a really good way for us to think about this, that there are different levels of engagement with each outcome. Um, so for example, there's a difference between being able to perform staccato as an isolated concept and the ability to apply it stylistically to a piece of music. In this case, we're escalating that skill. Uh, in a spiral curriculum model. The first time we encounter it, staccato is a separated note. The next time we encounter it, staccato varies based on the musical context that we're looking at. So when we look at outcomes in uh, CMP, we find that outcomes are built around three broad categories. The first of those are skill outcomes. Um, these are the specific technical demands and technical proficiencies we expect students to develop. Um, these could be things such as music literacy, specific performance techniques, um, instrument competencies, um, compositional practices. Um, these are the, the doing um, sorts of outcomes that students um, are unable to do something at the beginning of the lesson and are going to be able to do something at the end of the lesson they previously could not. The second level of out out outcomes are cognitive outcomes. And these are the knowledge um, based sorts of outcomes. What do we want students to know about music? Um, this can be concepts of theory, concepts of history, culture, uh, understanding the context from which our music is drawn. And it's important to note that cognitive and skill-based uh, outcomes oftentimes closely interact. Um, a cognitive outcome about, around the musical style of a piece will influence the way that we apply the skills. So oftentimes those skills are about application of cognitive outcomes. And last but not least, um, and importantly within CMP, is that we have affective outcomes. This is a recognition that music has a subjective de uh, dimension for us, uh, that music impacts us emotionally, that the program of the music carries a story um, that can't always be quantified down in neat, pretty ways. This is about aesthetics, style, and character in the music. Um, this is also inclusive of issues of social emotional learning and recognizing the role that music can play in the social and emotional lives of our students. Importantly, there's an emphasis on the craft of music making here, um, of being able to look at the cognitive aspects of music, look at the skills aspects of music, and question why does it matter, uh, and making sure that there's space to do that within our classrooms. The second category of CMP, the se second component, is that of music selection. 
And uh, for this, I think H. Robert Reynolds um, states it perhaps perfectly, the repertoire is the curriculum. Um, so throughout CMP, we're going to find that there is a strong emphasis on the concept of high quality repertoire. Um, but it's important to note that that is not a fixed value. Um, what defines high quality is going to vary based on the students and the situation in which they're learning. So one of those criteria is uh, one that I think is music, as, as musicians, we pretty commonly recognize, the idea that music is well crafted. And this comes from our analysis of the musical score. Um, is there a balance of predictability along with uniqueness in the music? So are, is there something familiar that students can gain? But is there something unique about this piece uh, that makes it stand out from other works? Is there depth in the parts? Uh, if I'm working with a band setting, do all students have access to quality parts? Or is it just great parts for the flutes, clarinets, and trumpets? And you know the bassoons and tubas are going to be sitting on half notes uh, the entire piece uh, without musical uh, intentionality. And um, importantly, this idea of uniqueness, that there is something about the piece um, that makes it stand out from other works, um, that there's a complexity in the way that there's various elements. And we're going to talk about analysis here uh, in just a moment. Uh, there's a, a complexity in which the elements within the piece interact with one another. That it's not just a great piece because of one element, but because of the gestalt, the big picture of all of it. Importantly, when we're defining high quality uh, repertoire, uh, there's a question of appropriateness that comes into this. Does it match the students that are in the classroom? Um, Granger's um, Lincolnshire Posey is a wonderful piece of music, and I don't think anyone would question the fact that it's well crafted. It is not an appropriate piece of music for my seventh grade band. Um, so when we're talking about how high quality music, these two elements of is it well crafted and is it appropriate for my students hold the biggest bearing in determining that. This makes it that you are the best judge for what high quality literature is for your students because you know your students better than anyone else. A third component to consider is whether the piece is teachable. Um, are there critical concepts that are presented in such a way that students are going to be able to learn them in isolation and then make connections to them um, both within that individual piece of music but also as they transfer th that learning to other pieces of music that, that they'll encounter in the future. Um, and this idea of transferability is critically important. If we think about the average music program, um, students are typically going to see somewhere around 12 to 16 pieces of music in one academic year. Is this piece high quality enough in the way that it's crafted, in its appropriateness for my students, in its teachability, that those 12 to 16 pieces that they'll see um, have implications to the broader music making that they'll do throughout their entire lives? Is it inclusive of all the sorts of ways that music can be made and encountered uh, by our students so that the experience they have in our classroom isn't an end, but rather a beginning for what comes next? This issue of high quality literature um, is highly dependent on the third criteria or the third component of CMP, which is musical analysis. And as Patricia O'Toole, uh, another one of the scholars in the area of CMP notes, within every good piece of music, there is a rich curriculum waiting to be discovered by your inner musical detective. There's a critical shift that happens in CMP in the way that we approach the concept of music analysis or score study. Um, in traditional score study, our concern is about preparation for being able to create the music as um, it is written. Um, it is about the rehearsal process itself. When we're talking about analysis in CMP, that is still a key concern. We're still concerned about the music making experience that our students have, but there's a second component, which is asking about what can be learned from a specific piece of music. What are the opportunities that this piece of music poses? And as we consider those, which of those opportunities are most important for us? In any given concert cycle um, and in any given piece, we have a limited amount of time, a limited amount of resources to commit to that work. We certainly aren't going to be able to explore all the facets of a particular piece. So the analysis uh, phase of CMP is really about digging deep into the music so that we're not caught off guard, um, so that we know what it is that music can, the music can provide and we can make educational decisions as teachers as ensemble directors uh, to be able to best provide for our students' future music making needs. So when we look at CMP analysis, um, we're going to find that there are several components that it, it holds in common with pretty much all analytical processes. 
Um, first is looking at the musical elements that are present within the piece, things like melody, harmony, rhythm, uh, form, timbre, texture, the expressive um, elements within that music. This is doing the rich score study of digging in to come to understand as musicians ourselves and as educators as well, um, what exactly is expected by the music that is before us. But understanding what's on the page isn't nearly enough um, within a CMP model, and this comes back to those um, cognitive and affective outcomes. It's about going beyond just the music on the page and questioning what impact that has going beyond. Affective elements of music are critically important as part of this analysis as well, and this is considering the context from which this piece is, or the, the uh, background from which this piece is drawn. What is the program of the piece? What is the story that's trying to tell? Or perhaps it is a piece of absolute music and doesn't have a fixed program. What are the implications for the way that we approach that? Um, how are we going to interpret it? What are the elements that are going to maintain interest for our students? What are the key characters of this music? And importantly, what is the impact that this music has on us as performers and on uh, the audience that we potentially would present it to? Um, when we're considering the expressive content of pieces of music, these serve as helping us make the musical decisions as part of the rehearsal, but they also serve to help our students understand how to make meaningful choices. And gradually throughout the CMP process, the goal is moving the locus of control from the teacher and moving it to the students. Finally, um, there's an important emphasis within CMP on understanding the context from which the piece is drawn. Um, this is what falls outside of the piece of music itself. What is the, story, the piece's background? What is the background of the composer? What is the history of this work? What is the culture from which it's drawn? Um, why does this piece exist? And these contextual elements are critically important because these are the ones that allow for curricular transfer. So for example, we might be studying a range of marches over the course of a student's high school uh, career. Um, and there's a key difference between the American Military March and the American Circus March. An understanding of the way a march is structured and the basic components and differences between those will inform the way that a student approaches a Sousa march versus a King march. Similarly, as a choral student, um, students may come to understand the core concepts of leader through the study of a particular Schumann um, song. Later in their career, they may encounter now a Schubert leader and be able to apply those skills that they've already learned about uh, romantic choral writing to a new context. So it's about making sure that we're teaching smarter, not harder. Making sure that we can transfer ideas from one lesson to the next, from one piece to the next, from one musical experience to the next. I think the element that makes um, analysis most unique within CMP is this idea of the heart statement. And I like to rephrase that as the so what statement. Um, as musicians ourselves, this is about asking the question of what attracts us to this specific piece. What keeps your interest as a musician? And importantly, as teachers, what do we want our students to experience? What do we want the student takeaway to be at the end of the day? Um, why should our students care about this piece? And if they forget about all those other objectives that we've taught, what is the one takeaway or the two takeaways that they should have? This comes back, I, I think, to that core idea of what makes quality literature quality. Great pieces of music compel us in some way. And it may be because of the great musical artistry, so that musical analysis, and we can understand the depth and complexity that's in it. It may be that there's an affective element to it, that it has a program unlike any other, that it tells a story that connects to who we are. It may be that that piece serves at a pivotal point in music history, that serves as a springboard for what comes next. We want to make sure that our students understand not only that they can play the notes, that they can present it at a concert, but that these pieces carry meaning. Um, and that the meaning that those pieces carry um, have the intentionality with them that we want to bring as teachers. So now we get into the nuts and bolts of the actual teaching. Uh, the fourth component that we have within CMP is the idea of instructional strategies. And what's important to note here is that we're talking about being explicit in the way that we plan activities for students so that students have intentional learning. Again, this goes back to the reactionary model of the rehearsal, um, that students are going to come with problems, that my job as the director of the ensemble is to fix those problems, to move us collectively together towards a musical interpretation of a work. 
Within CMP, while that is still in place, there's an intentionality here of making sure that we're scaffolding instruction that we're providing different experiences within it so that there's a learning process that our students encounter. That the, those outcomes that we set at the beginning um, are met in the end of the unit, end of the lesson, so that students have defined learning. And as Robert Garofalo, again, um, who's working with what he calls the blueprint for band, which is um, not CMP, but has a lot of the same sort of con uh, components to it, teaching and learning strategies are usually designed to involve students in activities that reflect musical behaviors found in society. When we're talking about strategies in CMP, this is not about doing esoteric work that has nothing to do with what real musicians do, but rather about providing students with a range of experiences that real musicians do. And a good way to think about this is looking at our national standards. Uh, and those core processes of learning are the sorts of things that we want to make sure that our students um, experience as a consequence of our classroom. So there's uh, four major key components to the strategies within CMP. One is that this is about student active engagement. Now, engagement here means a little, something a little different than playing their instrument than singing their part. Um, that is certainly a piece of it, but this is also about in critical uh, cognitive engagement, that students are doing critical thinking, they're making connections, they're collaborating with one another, that there's an interaction that happens that doesn't come through the teacher and back out again and then from the teacher and to the students, but rather between students, building that community as musicians. Again, engaging in the activities that musicians do, um, which is certainly music making, but also goes beyond that. A second aspect is that um, strategies within CMP are very specifically concept or skill based. They're focused on those core outcomes that uh, we discussed earlier, as opposed to being measure based. Our concern isn't about learning measure 39, but rather learning the concepts that measure 39 presents. Measure 39 has staccatos written in a British concert band style, and that carries meaning as opposed to here's how we're going to play this rhythm. Importantly, when we're talking about strategies in CMP, this is about providing students multiple ways of knowing. We have all had that student in our classroom who has a great musical ear, but is terrible on their instrument. Uh, we've all had that student also who has the most beautiful instrument um, on the planet, can create the most beautiful sound, but has none of the cognitive skills behind it to understand the music making that they're doing. The emphasis within CMP is to provide students multiple points of entry. Um, so that all sorts of learners are able to learn. This aligns very closely to universal design principles. Um, again, coming back to the national standards, I think this provides us a great way to think about this. National standards point out that we have four core processes as music educators, uh, to create, to perform, to respond, and to connect. We want to make sure that students have the opportunity within our ensemble spaces to engage in activities to engage in instructional strategies that involve all of those. So that student who can imitate but not understand has the opportunity to build that competency. But likewise, that student with a rich musical understanding is able to demonstrate their strengths, even if they're not able to perform them on their instrument or with their voice. Last but not least, um, there is an emphasis on a scaffold scaffolded form of engagement. Again, coming back to this idea of a spiral curriculum. The teacher is constantly building on learning that the students have had before. And this is where the student comes into play in the CMP process. It's not just about the piece of music, but it's about understanding what the students can do, what the students can't do, and what they're able to do with support. Um, this lines up really closely with Vygotsky's idea of zones of proximal development. And he basically argues uh, that there are three different large categories of student activities within our classroom. One, things that our students can do on their own already. Um, so in my particular classroom, it might be that my students can play folk, uh, folk song based melodies. They're in a duple meter with a limited range, really symmetrical rhythms, really straightforward. They don't need my support. So along the same lines, when these sorts of activities come into my classroom, I should allow the students to lead that. I should allow the students to gauge that learning. Similarly, there are things that my students cannot do in any situation. If I'm a middle school band director, my band is not going to be able to play Lincolnshire Posey, regardless of how wonderful of a piece of music it can be. These are the activities that we want to avoid in our classroom. And I'm going to put a caveat on there for now. Because the third category is what students can do with our support. And within a CMP model, this is where the sweet spot for instruction is at. 
We want to take students right from the edge of what they cannot do currently and then drop them off right at the edge of what they can do completely on their own. And the core idea behind this is that this is a constantly cyclical process. So once we get students finally able to do something on their own, now we go back to that line between can and cannot, and we pick one of those concepts that they can just barely do with our support, and we start to develop their independence there. So the question is, how do we do this? So first thing, we're going to get rid of the things that the students cannot do. We're going to make sure that we don't ask our students in our ensemble to do things that are beyond their ability. Um, and this goes through a process within CMP of cognitive apprenticeship. This isn't just about being able to get the students to push down the right keys, to play the notes in the right time, because I as the director know how it works and you as the students can just replicate it, but rather making sure that students have deep, meaningful understanding of how that learning happens. So the first stage in this is through modeling. And this is where I lead by my teacher example. I provide explanation. I do guided rehearsal. I model myself. And importantly, when we're doing this modeling phase uh, stage, it's important that we're giving clear cognitive modeling. We're not just telling students what they need to do, but we're explaining why we're doing those things. What am I thinking? We provide that insight into, through a think aloud, into my own thought processes, and explain why I'm gonna ask them to do what they're doing. So for example, I might, instead of saying, can we just isolate measure 39? Nope, the staccato's not long enough. I make sure that I'm explicit. I hear that there's a disagreement between the flute and the clarinet in their staccato style. Could we isolate that at 39 and make sure that we match that style? It took all of three to four seconds more to do that explanation, rather than just saying, start measure 39, watch the staccato. But what I've done is I've pointed for the students to what it is that I, as an expert musician, hear. And the hope is that by doing this iteratively, we bring our students to be able to do that on their own. And that gets to our second stage. Um, and this is where, again, the sweet spot of our instruction should be at, which is the coaching sh stage. At this point, we're doing shared decision making with our students. We expect our students to provide input. We expect our students to make decisions. We expect them to justify the choices they make. But at the same time, we're moderating that space as a teacher. We're guiding them through it. And initially, that's with a lot of heavy-handed guidance. But over time, they start becoming more independent in it. So, um, instead of pointing out that the clarinets and flutes don't have a matching staccato style 39, I might pose the question, does anyone hear what's happening at measure 39? And reluctantly, a student goes, I I'm not sure if the clarinets and flutes are together. Great, so what do we do about it? Well, maybe we should isolate just those two parts. Again, this has taken a couple seconds more out of our rehearsal. But what I've now done is uh, turned on um, the, the idea of minds on rehearsal. Students are critically listening and critically analyzing, and importantly, when they're not playing, they know they have the responsibility still to listen to the rest of the ensemble. This may seem that it takes a lot of time, and at first it does. But the good news is, is that if we start doing that minds on rehearsal, over time, I no longer need to stop and say, does everyone hear what's happening at 39? Could someone explain? But rather, we get to the point where I, as the teacher, can fade out. I can take a step back, and when we have issues, as in this one, of stylistic agreement of articulation, the students are already aware of those issues. They're taking care of it on their own. When I stop the ensemble, the student turns to the one next to them and goes, your staccato's too long. Can you make sure you put a little bit more breath in that? The students come to understand that, and they take on that responsibility, which now frees me up as the teacher to work on more advanced concepts. The ones that when the students are dependent solely on me, I can never get to. Um, what's important within this is this is intentionally designed and sequenced all the way through a series of activities. I intentionally start by doing heavy modeling, where I am the model for the students. I intentionally move to um, activities that allow the students to take on responsibility. And I intentionally have phases where I expect the students to make those corrections, make those changes themselves. And this can apply to performance. This can apply to creation. This can uh, apply to the way that we respond, the way we connect. So all four of those pr key processes of arts that the national standards outline can be played out within this way. So a key piece within CMP, and the one that as ensemble directors we oftentimes forget, is the one of assessment. And I want to put a couple of caveats in here. Um, I know we can take a look and go, I assess all the time. I listen to my ensemble perform. I know whether they know how to play. The question within CMP is about the individual student. Are 
is each student within your classroom able to meet those outcomes that you set up at the very beginning? Which is very different from can my ensemble play measures 39 to 47? Collectively, they can. But as we all know, there are students who rely on that student who's in the ensemble around them. A second caveat that I want to put in here is that assessment is different than grading. So when we're talking about assessment within CMP, um, this is about gauging, and as uh, Steve Morrison and Steve Demarest state, gauging the progress of each individual student within the group towards clear musical goals. Um, we set those outcomes at the beginning. Is each student able to meet those skill-based outcomes, those cognitive-based outcomes, those affectively-based outcomes that we set up? In order for this to happen, it calls for multiple assessments throughout. And importantly, an assessment is not stop class, step aside, now we assess and we come back, but rather a process is embedded within our classroom. Um, this may include grades, but it doesn't have to. Within CMP, assessment is emphatically about seeing if our students understand the concepts in front of them, the outcomes that we've set, and then the question of, so what do we do about it? This is formative assessment at its best. So there's a couple of key pieces to building this assessment wall within CMP. One is that assessment should be authentic. We are asking students to do activities that real musicians do. Again, not just addressing performance, but processes of creation, processes of response, and processes of connection. Second, assessment should be engaging. Students are doing something actively as part of this that actively contributes to their music making and their music experience. So it's not pause the class, everyone fill out this list of definitions, but rather making sure that we're taking the concepts we're asking students to do and applying them in meaningful ways. Third, assessment is integrated. Again, this isn't stop the class, time to go and assess, but rather we flow from instruction into assessment, assessment into instruction, uh, and there's a strong emphasis placed upon the processes of informal assessment, being able to do spot checks and doing it systemically, systematically rather, so that we know that every student within the classroom is grasping the concepts and able to meet the outcomes that we set. Importantly, assessment is intentional. This doesn't happen because of the perfect teachable moment, but rather happens because we planned to do it there. Um, we make sure that we build on the learning that's already occurred, and we're assessing students in the tasks that we've asked them to do within our teaching strategies. We don't all of a sudden take a pivot and say, hey, you've never done this before, this is now your assessment. But rather, the same sort of activity that we do in the classroom is the same way we assess, or vice versa. We build our assessments on the experience that students have in our classroom. Importantly, assessment is a formative process. It's a cyclical one. Um, we instruct we assess, we reflect on that assessment, and then we repeat again, having our instruction change as part of that assessment. And importantly, while assessment certainly can be summative, the majority of our assessment is focused on a formative sort of model. This is about instructive assessment, not evaluative assessment. And I want to bring it back to that initial conversation around outcomes. All of this is built upon the outcomes that we set for our students. Our assessments um, don't arise out of uh, thin air. They don't come down because we say, well, we have to grade our students now. Here's our, our assessment process. But rather, we have clearly set outcomes. We have clearly set instructional strategies. And out of those outcomes, out of those strategies, comes the way that we assess our students. So at this point, you may be asking, what exactly does CMP look like in practice? Um, and I want to go to the work of Jackie Wiggins. Um, who's one of the great constructivist music educators that we've got. And I think this um, encapsulates the idea behind CMP really well. Um, the primary role of the learner is to engage actively, thoughtfully, and reflectively. And the primary role of the teacher is to scaffold the learner's endeavors. Our role as the teacher is to make sure that our students have great educational and musical experiences. Our students' role in this is to constantly be the ones engaged in the active doing. Not just the playing, not just the music making, but the thinking, the doing of music. So I'm going to uh, walk through this using one of my favorite pieces of music um, for comprehensive musicianship through performance, which is Ray Fawn Williams' Folk Song Suite. For me, this is for a, a quality high school band, um, kind of the epitome of high quality music. Um, I've done this in many different ways. I've done this with many different heart statements. Um, but one way that we might look at it 
is looking at a heart statement that really emphasizes that folk music is a product of every new hand that touches it. Um, and Vaughn Williams' folk song suite is no exception to this. Um, he took rough ragtag uh, country uh, songs and applied his expertful um, late romantic hand to them to create something that is distinctly different than what they were, but still maintains the expressive, the affective qualities of that original music. So with that in mind, I'll have done a rich and extensive analysis. That analysis looks at the structural components, how he builds melodies, how the various parts interact, the, the counterpoint that happens uh, between upper woodwinds and low brass, low woodwinds uh, throughout the piece. I'm looking at um, the stories that are behind this, the original texts um, that the folk songs are based upon. Many of these actually have the original archival recordings that Von Williams based his, record, his uh, composition on. So I'm listening to those to understand where this music came from. I'm doing outside, now, outside research to recognize the impact that Vaughn Williams has on later composers. Um, the tradition of folk music composition that happens in the United States in the concert band movement and continues today. Um, and see this not just as a piece that stands alone, but really is the first piece in a long sequence of other works. So once I've done that analysis, I move on to my outcomes. Um, and you'll notice that these outcomes um, build around those big areas of skills, cognitive issues, and affective ones. Uh, so one important skill within this is recognizing the difference between staccato, legato, and accent, and being able to perform those accurately in the context of the music. Uh, Vaughn Williams oftentimes juxtaposes these against each other. So students' awareness of these various articulations and how to perform them is critically important. Um, there's a cognitive piece that comes into play around this same exact issue of articulation style, which is this is one of the preeminent examples of the British concert band movement. So what are the stylistic considerations in playing staccatos, accents, legatos in this piece, as opposed to, say, a Sousa March um, of roughly the same era? And last but not least, there are affective um, outcomes within this. And this is recognizing that within this single work, um, there are represented no less than eight folk songs. And each of those folk songs have a distinctly different character, a distinctly different personality to them. Um, do our students understand what those characters are and the moods that each of these stories tell? In some cases, they're stories of young love. In other cases, it's stories of love lost. And one of them is a great story about a serial murderer and his demise in the end. Um, so everything from love to despair um, to a weird, dark, celebratory, morose something or other. Um, can our students understand that and understand how that impacts the way that they create that music? Can that story be conveyed to an audience even if they don't know the ins and outs of each of those pieces? So to do this, we use a variety of different strategies. Um, some of these are purely performative. Others involve some sort of writing, some sort of discussion. Uh, but the important piece is that students are engaged in the sorts of activities that they would do as musicians. Um, so we might do comparative listening. We'd listen to those archival recordings and then listen to a professional uh, concert band perform this piece and compare how they um, are different or similar. And that, in turn, then, comes back to impact the way that we rehearse our piece. Um, I love using the idea of negative examples, having students um, create non-examples of what we're trying to do. So we take um, the very first melody um, in it, 16 Comes Sunday, um, at, which is a, a love story of all sorts. And what happens if we play this as a mad story? How does that change our interpretation? What if we play this yellow? What changes within that? And by creating those negative examples, students become more aware of the decisions they make in interpreting the music as it is on the page. Peer modeling can be a critical piece to this, identifying the student who is executing articulation technique really well and allowing them to be able to be heard, um, giving them prominence within the classroom. This is that coaching phase where we are in fading phase where we take a step back and let students step forward. And likewise, allowing students to critique one another. The first time we do this, this can be um, a, something to, that we want to be cautious about. But as we do it more and more, um, it allows students to understand our music making uh, in more significant ways and become more comfortable with critiquing one another. Um, similarly, we can do um, a pair share where I ask students to turn to the student next to them 
and discuss ways that they might um, interpret a particular passage and then share it with the entire class. And that becomes our rehearsal plan for the day. Um, lots of other ways that we can talk about shared uh, rehearsal planning likewise where students provide the lesson objectives of the day. Um, I've done it where students come into class and they list off on the board all the things that they would like to work on. And that becomes our checklist um, with my guidance as part of that. Um, in a piece like this that is built around so many different folk songs, um, it's critical that we understand what that music is. With that said, if there's eight folk songs, that's a lot of music to learn. So if we break the class into groups and each group takes their piece of the jigsaw puzzle, they become the experts on it. So when we study, if we play the section in the first movement on John Barleycorn, um, that group stands up and goes, let me tell you the great story in this, and here's why this music sounds this way. Um, rather than my providing that background, my students become the ones who dictate how the class progresses forward, and they take more ownership in that musical learning. So when we get to the process of assessment, again, some of these are purely performance. Some are more critical skills. Um, it's critically important with CMP that we know where students are at all the way along the way. We have a model, obviously, in place of doing uh, playing tests at the end of a unit once students should have accomplished something. Um, but I love the idea of a 10-second soloist. In this, we take the last two minutes of every class and students literally play 10 seconds of music, and we just go straight down the line. This allows me to get um, hear where students are at. It allows students to hear each other, to understand where they're uh, going. And if we do this every single day, I can rotate through an entire classroom once a week, hearing key parts of the music, understanding what my students can and can't do, which then informs the way that I need to instruct them. Are they ready for me to step back, or do they need me to still stay present? Um, melody three-way is um, kind of a, a variation on um, the negative examples. Um, asking students in a playing test to provide multiple interpretations and self-critique them not only um, indicates that students understand the concepts of articulation of style, but also that they can reflect on the impact that that makes affectively. Um, turn and talks are a great way um, for us to be able to assess individual knowledge. Uh, I don't have a chance to hear every student in the classroom. But I can certainly have two students pair, and then two pairs pair, and then two pairs of pairs pair, and then have those students report out. And collectively, they report on the one or two things that they felt were most important. What should we do in this rehearsal coming up? How can we address this problem? And collectively, I start to understand, at least in small groups, where my student understanding is. If I do this regularly, I start to gain an understanding of the individual. The process of self-reflection is critically important because this allows the student, who isn't a great performer, but is a great musician in other ways, to be able to show their understanding. Um, similarly, doing rehearsal plan exit slips can be a great way to engage students in that shared decision making. Can students critique what they hear and they can they prescribe a solution? And this is as easy as at the end of class saying, for tomorrow, the rehearsal is yours. Everyone write down a specific eight measures that you want to work on and what the concept is. That becomes our rehearsal plan. And I can gauge now individually what is it that the students are hearing, what is it that they understand. This can kind of flip around of having a student come forward and serve as the clinician of the day. That student stays at the front of the classroom, and just like a clinician who came in, they provide guidance in, here's what I'm hearing, here's where it needs to go. Um, if we do this constantly throughout the year and rotate through students, it allows students to guide that activity. It also allows me to see what is it the students are hearing, what is it they're thinking, how are they connecting with this music, which transcends what they can do as they play. So I encourage you to continue looking at CMP as a model for instruction. Um, there are some great resources out there. Um, both the Wisconsin MEA and the uh, Illinois CMP Project have extensive websites that have pre-made lesson plans already there, um, taking high quality works as defined by their teachers. Um, and these are all volunteer groups um, and you can certainly volunteer your uh, projects to it as well and allow you to be able to dig in on those details. Um, two great books that um, address CMP directly and are ones to put on your shelf, um, Shaping, um, Shaping Sound Musicians and Just Good Teaching, uh, Shaping Sound Musicians by Patricia O'Toole and uh, Laura Simberg's Just Good Teaching, um, really walk through CMP in much greater detail than I just did. Um, there are resources definitely to have on your shelf if uh, CMP is something that interests you. Um, additionally, I'd like to point to just a couple other books, Robert Groffalo's Blueprint for Band, Joseph Labuda's uh, Teaching Musicianship, and then Jackie Wiggins' uh, Teaching for Musical Understanding. Well, not CMP proper. Um, they address the same sorts of issues and provide a different perspective. So if you like some of what you heard, but you're like, eh, maybe that's not for me, 
These are um, some other great resources. In the meantime, by all means, please reach out to me. I'd love to work with you uh, further as you develop your understanding of CMP. Thank you for joining me today, uh, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.